what you're told about yourself and what other people are told about you changes the way you behave towards them, the way they see you, and the actual impact on things as simple as golf, as complex as intelligence, and maybe even as deep as what it means to be an addict or an alcoholic. Welcome to the Ignited Recovery Podcast, a new way forward for anyone looking for answers but feeling left out. If you've been searching for empowerment, triumph, and purpose, you've found them right here. You won't hear the same solutions, and you're not going to have any excuses to fall back on, because Ignited Recovery allows heroes to rise and become their best selves. I'm Dr. Adi Jaffe, and I can't wait to be your guide on this journey. Are you ready to become an Ignited Hero? Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ignited Recovery Secrets Podcast. Uh, I'm Adi Jaffe, happy to be here with you today. And um, I have a, a workshop coming out at the end of this month. Um, we're going to have links to it on the bottom, etc. but it's literally in a few days from when this episode comes out. And the workshop is, are you really an alcoholic and what to do about it? And so I figured I would dive into that a little bit here to give those of you who are interested or thinking about it a little glimpse into the kind of conversation that we're going to be having. Obviously, I'm not going to do the whole thing. It's going to be like an hour, hour and a half workshop, and I'm going to talk to you here for 10 to 15 minutes, but I think it's an important topic and one that I see things pretty differently than a lot of other people, so I figured we'll do a little intro here, okay? Sound good? Perfect. Um, I thought about doing this primarily because I ended up talking to somebody about the story of me walking into rehab the first time. And for those of you who don't remember my whole story, go back and listen to it in one of the other episodes. We'll put a, a link to that as well, but where I tell my actual story. And I'd gotten arrested because of my drug use and dealing, got sent to jail. And then when I was out while fighting my case, my lawyer told me I got to go to rehab. So we found a rehab, ended up signing me up, and a girlfriend at the time drove me to it. And she drove me in her car, and it was, I didn't really know what to expect, but we get to this house in Pasadena, and they check my bag like they always do. She has to leave, she can't come in with me. And once they finish checking my bag and show me my room, they walk me to a group. And in that group, there were about 20, 25 people sitting around in a circle. And a leader, a, a counselor who was sitting there talking. And he welcomed me in. And, and what I would find is a pretty common approach would kind of, he sat me in the middle of the circle and he started asking me some questions. And one of the first questions was, tell us why you're here. And I started giving normal, everyday human um, explanations of what that is. So I said, you know, I got arrested and my lawyer told me that I really need to go to rehab because I have to clean up before my court date and my trial so that I don't spend much time in jail. And he goes, uh, no, that's not why you're here. I said, okay, um, I've been addicted to meth for about four or five years and I've tried to stop and I haven't been able to on my own. And so I came here. Nope, that's not why you're here. Okay. Um, my parents really want me to clean up and... I'm really, I really don't want to disappoint them like I had before. And so I want to do what they want me to do. And that's why I'm here. And I, I kept trying to get to a deeper and deeper explanation, which is what I thought they were asking me. And after what seemed like 30 to 45 minutes, I got the answer because the guy gave it to me. And he said, no, you're here because you're an addict and an alcoholic. And that's why you're here. And you welcome, you've come to the place you belong. And it was the first time I even heard that idea. I knew I was addicted to meth before, but the idea that because I was addicted to meth, I'm an addict and an alcoholic had never really come up before. And it really taught me the language, it taught me the language of this new world that I hadn't been introduced to. And, you know, I got to say over time, that was 2001. So, you know, 18 years ago. And I've learned to understand that while I believe that most people in that room thought they were doing me a favor, right? Like they were essentially telling me what was wrong with me, what condition I had so that I could deal with it and then give it the appropriate treatment. I think they were actually setting me up to fail if I'd continued listening to it. Now, not everybody agrees with me about this and I understand it. And so I'm going to talk about this in a few different specific factors. And I'm going to start out with just the origin of where does alcoholic addict come out of? I'm going to stick to alcoholic because addict came much later. But where does this term even come from? 
Then I'm going to talk about the power of the beliefs that come along with those definitions. Uh, and eventually I'm going to talk about um, what happens when we stick to existing beliefs and ignore individual differences. And so, you know, to start us out, I think it's important for a lot of us to understand where this alcoholic and then addict kind of terms came out of. And so I did some digging and some research into the languaging and the term alcoholic itself was only present in the late 19th century. So around 1890, there's a variation called called alcoholist um, as early as 1870 some. Um, And Early on, it may have just meant somebody who drinks, even before those late 1800s, by the temperance movement. And those of you who don't know what the temperance movement is, is this was a movement to eradicate alcohol completely from society because alcohol is bad and nobody should drink it. It's evil. Uh, It's against God's commands. And it was a very religious and religiously oriented movement to completely abolish alcohol. This is what ended up in the Second Amendment and the removal of um, of alcohol from society, which brought on um, the entire black market of alcohol and actually brought on hard liquor later on. And so it's around that time that the word is first used. Now, even before that word was used, though, the idea that this condition of people who struggle with drinking all the time, something called habitual drunkenness by Dr. Benjamin Rush, who's actually one of the signatories to the um, Constitution, Um he, in 1808, already recognized habitual drunkenness as a disease, uh, which is kind of still in line with current thinking. He just didn't call it alcoholism. The first person who actually called that disease alcoholism seems to be a Swedish physician by the name of Magnus Haas. Uh, and he used that term in 1849 or so. So we're talking about early with habitual drunkenness all the way to late 19th century is the origin of the word alcoholism. Um To put that in context, we're talking about about 150 to 200 years ago. And I just want to remind everybody that this is still the time where there were cholera outbreaks all over the world, including the US and Europe. And at the time, people were disagreeing about why that happened because the idea of bacteria and viruses weren't really well understood. So some people thought that cholera was called by, caused by poor people and, and the places they lived at, so poverty. Uh, other people thought that African-Americans uh, in the U.S., people thought African Americans brought on um, cholera, and some people in Britain thought that God, God was punishing people with cholera because it was so. I mean, it was a pandemic, right? So thousands and millions of people were dying. Um, it was also the time of about when we discovered something called hysteria, which was actually a clinical diagnosis in the uh, psychiatric literature still until the 1980s, by the way. But when it first started out, it was considered a physical ailment by women, uh, primarily assumed to be caused by the fact that they had a uterus and that uterus would move around and cause pressure internally uh, or some other unknown injuries. Or as Sigmund Freud suggested, uh, hysteria could be caused by the internal psychological scarring of the woman recognizing she has no penis. And the reason I'm saying these is, you know, this is before we understood diseases and conditions at all. And yet we gave this term of alcoholism as a disease and alcoholics as people who have this disease in the very, very earliest days of even the medical profession, let alone the psychological and psychiatric profession, right? Um, We're talking about profession who, like I mentioned, until the 1980s considered women to be hysterical, uh, homosexuality to be a mental health condition, right? This is the time that we're talking about where alcoholic came about. Um, Now, if you haven't watched my TED Talk or a lot of my talks about the power of beliefs, when we have these beliefs, especially beliefs that have been around since 150, 200 years ago, it causes real... um, objective, measurable outcomes in our lives. And one of the examples I talk about a lot in my talks is something called the Pygmalion effect. And this was studied best by um, researcher Robert Rosenthal, who went to a school and wanted to see what happened if teachers believed that some of their students were smarter than others. And so there was a whole setup for this experiment where um, he pretended to inject a special test into standardized testing in schools. And based on that pretend test, he told teachers that 20% of their students were identified by this special test called the Harvard Test of Inflected Acquisitions to be ready to become smarter than the rest of the students. He came back a year later, looked back at the standardized testing, and indeed he found that as a group, those 20% of students 
got about seven to eight IQ points smarter than the rest of the students, which is a lot in IQ points. Um, definitely a significant finding. And those students that were picked completely at random. And so what he was able to find is that because the teachers believed that those students are smarter, something in their interaction changed. Something in their ac- interaction made them actually be able to impart, because the students were never told this and the, their parents were never told this, the, the teachers imparted extra intelligence somehow onto their students. One explanation is something called the confirmation bias, by the way, which is another one of these psychological biases we have, whereby our brain organizes the world into things that fit into the way we currently see the world and things that don't. This is probably one of the main causes of why we're going through the ridiculous um, political climate that we're going through right now, because once you believe something is true, your brain pays more attention to other things that prove to you that what you believe is true. And so it's really hard to change your mind about core beliefs. Now, imagine if you're one of these teachers in the school where Dr. Rosenthal came out and told you 20% of your students are smarter than others. You may have now changed the way you see your students. And through confirmation bias, you might start seeing more and more evidence that those 20% of students are smarter. And maybe you give them more attention or you reward them more or treat them differently in a way that makes them feel better about themselves. And so they do more work and they study more while you leave the other students behind because, well, they're not as smart. And so confirmation bias changes the way we see the world, the way we believe things about the world, and therefore the way we behave in it. And then to top all of this off is an effect studied by a lot of people in early studies of cultural and racial psychology called the stereotype threat. And one of the seminal studies in this was a test that literally before giving people an intelligence test, had them identify themselves by racial categories or not. And when students had to identify themselves by their racial category, African-American students underperformed compared to white students on a set of questions. A difference that completely disappeared if they just were not asked to identify themselves by their groups. And so there was something about activating their racial category that changed the way these students learned, the way these students performed on the test. Now, it doesn't only go one way. So another study that I, I love about this stereotype threat was really interesting. It took they created this kind of golf task in a uh, in a lab. So you would go in, you'd get a putter, and you had to putt around in this little mini golf course. And they brought in black and white students in two different conditions. In the first condition, they brought in students and told them that the setup of the golf task that they, that they put together is there to test athletic intelligence. And guess who did better when they were testing athletic intelligence? White students did better. In the second condition, though, they brought in students and they told them, hey, what we're testing here is athletic innate ability. Well, in that condition, black students perform better. The difference was literally seven strokes on this task. If you play golf, you know how serious seven strokes are. Just based not on the task, the task stays exactly the same, but on the presentation of what the task was like. Now, let's take that out for what we're talking about here right now, right? What you're told about yourself and what other people are told about you change the way you behave towards them, the way they see you, and the actual impact on things as simple as golf, as complex as intelligence, and maybe even as deep as what it means to be an addict or an alcoholic. Now, here's the thing. When we start believing these labels, when we start seeing ourselves as fitting into these molds, we forget the individual part of who we are. And that's why in my work, primarily what I try to do with people is help them break out of their molds. Because, you know, I see people like Julia, who you uh, heard here on the podcast a few weeks ago, um, who, you know, struggle with heavy drinking for many, many years, struggle with success and seeing herself as being successful, had some biological issues related to her drinking, but not too many. And when we were able to resolve the psychological issues that she had, didn't stop struggling. Jessica, another client who you're going to listen to here, I was on her podcast recently. She's going to be on on this here uh, in the near future, has deep developmental struggles from early, early on that have caused ongoing psychological issues, drinking and other behaviors like that exacerbated where the environmental pressure came in later on in life. Uh, And so her unique circumstances are very different than Julia's and therefore require a different way of looking at it. Or 
Roger, not his real name, but a hockey player that I work with, for whom none of those issues were actually true. He was very successful early on in life, but was also very isolated because he grew up in these high intensity sports camps and these situations where you moved around from one environment to another year after year, every six months, sometimes really impossible to make friends. Uh, and so work and working on hockey and then on his athletic skills became the only thing in life. And so in college when he, and later on in later high school and college when drinking became a really big thing, it became like his refuge, his way to connect to other people and his way to deal with all the social isolation that he had in his life. For each one of those people, biology, psychology, environment, and spirituality, the concept of purpose and connecting to mindful existence in this world in the present moment, each one of those people that I just talked about were differently affected. And the limitation of thinking and believing that they fit into this broad category, I'm an addict, I'm an alcoholic, I'm like all other addicts and all other alcoholics, limits you in terms of finding your own results. Because in the end, the tools to break free are here. We know a lot of tools to help people break free from addiction. You just have to figure out which ones to use for yourself. Even just uh, two weeks ago, Donnie, who we had, you know, big 12-step believer, but it didn't work for him until he found physical movement in yoga. Because guess what? He's an athlete and he needed that as part of his recovery. We all need tools and we don't all need the same tools. When you go to traditional recovery, it's that whole old adage of, you know, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And speaking of that, you know, we moved into a new house. And so I'm building things, I'm putting up pictures, etc. When I put up pictures, I need a hammer because I need to put nails in the wall so that I can hang the pictures up. But yesterday I was hanging string lights um, outside on our patio. A hammer didn't help me because what I needed at the time was I needed a um, pair of pliers because I was using the steel wire to put these things up. Had I tried to use a uh, hammer to put those lights up, I would be really unsuccessful. If I had to cut some wood, which I'm going to need soon because I want to actually make one of our tables for the outside patio, you know, hammer is going to be useful for some parts of it, but to cut the wood, I need a saw. You see, tools exist so you can use a whole broad selection of them. The problem primarily when we think that everybody is the same, we start thinking that everybody needs the same tools. It's just not true. What we need is a toolkit. And so something I'm going to go over a lot in the workshop is once you understand where you are in this definition, what do you do next, right? What is it that you, uh, you're you supposed to follow? Because I got to tell you, I first walked in those rooms and for three years would stand up and say, my name is Adi and I'm an addict or an alcoholic, depending on which meeting I was in, because some wanted me to say one thing and the others wanted me to say something else. Uh, and I thought that now I discovered that I'm an addict and that's why I struggled. But within a few years, I started learning that there were other really, really important factors and reasons why I struggled. And I needed to set out about fixing each one of those. Like my family relationships, they had really struggled since I discovered my dad cheated on my mom and almost left us, since we moved to the States and I was really struggling socially. Um, you know, since there was no emotional connection and conversation in my house, those were tough things for me and I had to deal with them. Uh, feeling like a failure because I barely graduated school and work and because early on in life, I took from my dad that unless you're perfect, you're a failure. And I felt like a failure over and over and over. That had to be dealt with. The shame, the deep shame and social anxiety that I felt around others that was there early on in life, but then got worse when I moved to the States and didn't speak, speak English well and didn't feel like I fit in. Those were deep core issues that I needed to address. And after about two and a half to three years in my recovery, I realized that either I was never the kind of person that they were talking about to me in the group, so maybe that guy was completely wrong when he talked to me in that rehab, or I was and I'm not any longer and I wasn't going to be long-term. And nobody was giving me that answer at the time. I, it's like everybody just kept believing that, well, we found your label, alcoholic or addict, you are this thing and therefore we have a solution for you and this is the singular solution. You see, the thing is, they gave me their version. I needed to come up with my own. And I think that's important for everybody to do. So if you're listening right now and you don't know where you are, or you know somebody else who's fighting with, am I really or am I not? This workshop might be exactly the thing that you need. So what I want you to remember is click the link, see by the explanation if this workshop is really something you'd love because we're gonna have a lot more. We're gonna dig a lot more deeply into this topic as well as giving you actual tools and assessments that you can use to get a sense of how things are going for you or for your loved one right now. 
in the end, what we each need is to understand ourselves better. And then once we understand ourselves better, start using, borrowing, relying on others to teach us some of the tools that'll help. Because once we do all of that, we're going to get a much better, much clearer, much more complete sense of who we really are, which will lead to a life that is much happier, less connected by these dogmatic labels that we just, you know, dress up in. Um, I hope it was useful. I got to tell you in my own life, discovering my own path was just one of the most powerful things ever. You know, the life I have with Sophie now with our kids, the work I do with hundreds and thousands of people every year would not have been done if I didn't go through my own journey. And I want that for anybody who's listening right now. I want you to find your own journey. I want you to be able to find the loved ones in your life. I want them to find their journey so that you can all live happily ever after. Thank you so much for tuning in. Can't wait to see you at the workshop and at the Ignited Glow event. If you're coming in mid-October, it's going to be incredible. Love you all. See you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Ignited Heroes Recovery Podcast. I really hope you found the information here useful and that we'll see you back here next week. And look, I want to make sure that this podcast is the most useful it can be for you. So please let me know by emailing info at ignited.com if there are any specific topics or questions you'd like to have addressed. As usual, if you like this episode, I would love for you to leave us a five-star review and rating. Thanks and see you next week.